Hi everyone, I'm Tara. Hi, I'm Michelle. Welcome back to our podcast Books and Beyond with Bound season 4 where we speak to some of the finest writers in India to find out what makes them tick. Yes, and we are editors, podcasters and storytellers and through Bound we help you create stories and put them out into the world. I can't wait to speak to our guest today who is a rising star. Her debut made headlines as it's one of the best debuts in recent times. Yeah, so the the author is Riva Razdan. Uh, she's a young author. I remember reading the book when it had come in at, as a submission at the literary agency I work at. Uh, the book is called Arzu, and it is a historical love story. If you want to call the '90s and the time of liberalization historical, we're old guys. Um, and it takes you into this glitzy glam world. The protagonist is a young woman, you know, negotiating this glamorous world of industrialist foreign education media parties and more it's a, it's a love story it's a coming of age book it's much more than, than all that yeah and the best part is reva actually calls her book a feminist romance and we decided to have a very special first section for all of you where both of us dissect that term right so what does it mean which books and movies might fall into that category our personal lives and so much more Yeah I'm I'm really excited for that section I can't wait to begin on that right away but more about the episode first so in the episode with Riva we find out about obviously her inspiration for this amazing young woman Arzu um and she also has a filmy background so you know how did that play into the writing of the book Yes and if you're looking for guidance on your debut book you can reach out to us anytime for our mentorship program there are writing targets resources prompts and so much fun is in store but our offer ends on March 1st so very few days left very few slots left please use the discount code boundmenti2022 to get a 10% discount on our 3 month mentorship program So if you want to book your spot for the year do it now the link is in our show notes Okay so let's get into the conversation about the feminist romance genre So you know Michelle Riva has labeled her book as a feminist romance and hmm I think that both of us thought it was very interesting because very few authors actually you know categorize their books right we've had conversations in the podcast about authors saying you know my book is labeled as such and such but it's so much more than that um and i found this term very very interesting because it really made us think about this whole concept of you know which we've discussed before chiclet and romance and can romance and can chiclet be feminist how do people look at that so so what is a feminist romance according to you Oh me okay so actually i don't know the answer and that's one thing we wanted to say as well see we don't know the answer but we hope that you know through our discussion we will at least arrive at an understanding of what it might be um so for me tara i think um i would call something a feminist romance where a character can just be herself without being judged um you know so for for example i recently read an article okay in the newspaper about how erotica is is selling really well on audio platforms right like audible and other storytelling platforms and these m- women are minting money you know uh, but sadly you know some of them have to still use a pseudonym so i was just i was just thinking about you know all of these stories which might have which might give uh, women uh, you know sexual agency where you know they have control over things but yet the author cannot reveal their real name like i think for me a feminist romance would be where a character can be herself what about you tara what do you think it yeah is? no that's that's an interesting example of erotica and actually the use of a pseudonym um and it it makes me think about you know things have changed so much for women writers but there was a time when uh women writers forget about erotica but just writing regular stories did not use their own uh, names and actually like made up of made up a masculine sounding name and the most recent example of this is jk rowling where yeah, the publisher yeah. actually told her not to put joan uh, rowling and use jk because it's sort of you know this amorphous identity um and things have really changed from there but anyways that is a digression as to how women's writing has has changed in literature 
when i think of feminist romance i'm honestly uh, i, I it, it's hard to categorize something as a feminist romance um i was recently listening to a podcast interview which asked the question um can any sort of like het- het- heteronormative romance be feminist like if we speak about a heterosexual relationship and focus on that can that be feminist at all uh, is our quest for love is women's is a woman's quest for love um you know feminist and and i think obviously you know it is because a woman's quest for love is tied up with so many other social factors economic factors cultural factors um and a recent book that i read that is amazing at describing you know how a woman's quest for love is actually a, a topic that is serious that is worthy of you know uh, academic study and consideration is uh, a new book that's out uh, who we'll interview the author it's called desperately seeking sharuk which talks about uh, you know how lonely women in india are today uh so i do think that you know feminist romances are things that we have to take seriously a woman's quest for love is a serious topic um and you know even though it's being sort of labeled as this light fluffy cotton candy you can take it out of that cotton candy uh sphere and put it into something more serious and by the way serious things can also be funny so i also want to <laughs> put that caveat in Yes yes no and you know like you said uh, Tara it is problematic right so can a romance really be feminist so that actually brings me to the trope of working women you know where where female lead characters you know could work maybe they are self employed maybe they work for someone else and i remember this because uh, Tara you know after we recorded with Riva we were actually brainstorming about what feminist romance could be and you said that it could be um about a character who's probably working right so so could you please elaborate on that tara i didn't really understand yeah actually i think that that sentence was sort of like just a part of the brainstorm because which woman character doesn't work you know gone are the days when a woman working is revolutionary it is mainstream every woman character should work should have a job so i don't think that that necessarily constitutes feminist romance you know if you work and you fall in love that doesn't mean it's a feminist romance it means you're a normal person you know <laughs> that you have a job yeah. and you have a love life like that's okay you know so yeah. i don't know i i don't know exactly if that would fall into this label of feminist romance maybe a feminist romance maybe what i meant was that feminist romance is something where the focus of the story is not only on the love on somebody's love life but also takes into consideration the many other factors of her life that are contributing to the way that she thinks about love for example in arzu if we looking at riva rajnan's book she is looking at you know how her decisions about career how her decisions about where she wants to live how her decisions about the values she ascribes to her life fit in with the romantic interest that she is pursuing versus the story just being about simply her and a boy and you know trying to get that boy and you know heartbreak <laughs> yeah. and all of that so, so that i think is what i meant when i said, when i use the word working it is that you know other aspects of your life feed in and and i see this a lot in these sort of like newer romances especially romances written by women because you know in romances written by men you still have the woman character being a little one dimensional where you see a lot more of you know the romance aspect but less of the other aspects of her life but in you know especially in romances now being written by women like for example um, it's not a romance but it's a love it's you know it's a story about a marriage megna pants boys don't cry you know the center of the story is a marriage but you know there's so much more than that there's so much so much more about the woman's you know uh, social life economic life you know cultural context that comes into the play as well as with even anmol malik's book uh, three impossible wishes where the 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 in, the inciting incident is actually that you know anmol ha- uh, sorry the protagonist has to pass an accounting exam otherwise she'll be deported you know similarly yeah. in uh, paper moon rihana munir's paper moon the inciting incident 
is you know that she has to sort of like run this bookstore and then through her journey of running this bookstore she finds these men who may or may not support her may or not fit in to the life so i think to summarize it's a lot also about now we looking at romance as something that will fit into a woman's life versus a woman actually like trying to make her life fit into the romance hmm oh wow that's so much food for thought uh, tara but you know this uh, what all you mentioned all the lovely books that you mentioned reminded me of another writer um, so as you said you know stories written by women about women are obviously way better and, and they, they you know because they bring out this wholesome uh, you know experience of of a woman right because a woman does i think we are awesome at <laughs> multitasking way better way better than men and i think they they really bring that out well so it reminded me of this book uh, by andali vajid Uh, it's called Twenty Nine Turning Thirty, and I actually got that book because you know I turned thirty um, last year, and I was really curious about how she would capture that. But but one thing that stayed with me throughout in the book was you know her main character is a working woman, and so much about the scenes was set in the office, you know, was set with the colleagues. So I really like it when when you know writers are able to capture this kind of multitasking that women do because as you said, it's very normal, right? But that's something that we couldn't see. um in stories before so there's another thing that uh, you know uh, comes to mind uh, tara there's this trope of of a happily ever after right um and and you know i have discussed this with you earlier i grew up on fairy tales right on disney fairy tales um you know have you noticed tara all the you know princesses or all the heroines of these fairy tales their goal is to get the prince is to get married right to be to be i would say happily settled if i can use that term but there's nothing after that right where is the story after they get married what happens to her like is it like is it an end to her identity yeah and that brings me back to feminist romances you know i would yeah. love to see feminist romances also about marriage um yes. you know because i see and this is not only sort of like in the indian context but you see a lot of and that's the human experience right because there's so much more drama in the act of sort of getting love you know the first date for example you know the first the meet cute there's a lot of drama in that for storytellers you know but the everyday humdrums of a supposedly good or normal marriage might not lend that same amount of drama for storytellers you know uh but that is also that's very interesting that you know we don't see a lot of stories about what happens after the happily ever after i yeah. mean like meghna pant's example a book about you know her bad marriage um is a good example of what might happen after happily ever after and it's not as great as we we make it out to be so that's a more nuanced view then there's another book by um i think her name is veena venugopal and she writes about you know uh, uh, stories about women and their mother in laws and there are like some crazy stories um you know and that really takes like a very interesting view and then again i'm going to mention desperately seeking sharuk because she goes into a deep dive and you know what it means to be a woman who is married uh, in india how much more labor that these women have to do uh, than men in terms of taking care of their houses um yeah. but i don't really see any sort of like feminist romances about like what happens after marriage which is interesting the only one that i can think of right now is alain de botton's um the cause of love which basically is sort of like both a philosophical and storytelling deep dive into the lives of a very normal married couple um but then he also uses philosophy to sort of like add to that drama Ooh, but yeah like i have this, to pick that up that sounds really it's very good yeah so but yeah anyways to sum up you know like what mm. we see is mostly we see like these horror stories or we see like uh you know divorces we see affairs you know like yeah, decoupled like, like on netflix yeah like it reminded me of um uh, when i hit you by meena kandasamy so yeah, i yeah. can't call that a romance but yeah it, it's no like so i'm saying that you don't see story. so to sum yeah so to sum yeah. up you don't see romance exactly. right because there's not that much drama mm. that probably is you know because the romance genre has very particular ways of sort of uh, being written being portrayed so they it may or may not lend itself i don't know the stories that you do see or maybe you know a divorce and then a reconciliation second love all of those kinds of things so i don't know if the happily after the the story of what happens after marriage you know can be romantic can be mm. portrayed in that in this romance sphere is a feminist romance 
However, that being said, there is thankfully a lot more exploration of the story of what happens after marriage right now than there was ever before, and I hope that there would be more as well. Yeah, yeah, you know, even I hope so. And and you know, uh, while I was actually researching on this uh, term feminist romance, Tara, I came across some uh, something very interesting. So you know, there are lots of articles written by writers, but what one writer noticed that in most feminist uh, romance tales, um, you know, usually writers avoid the topic of abortion, right? And the reason I'm you know bringing this up is because you know I know this is a spoiler for all you readers out there who haven't read um, Arzu yet. But I thought Riva Razdan, uh, you know, I would say address that really well because because our protagonist actually, you know, undergoes something like this, and and it's not something we see in stories, right? Um, it's it's probably um, you know, something that that um, I would say kills the kills the joy or kills the romance um, of the story. But I think it's very realistic. And and there's a book that I want to uh, talk about, Tara. So there's this book, uh, French Lover, by Taslima Nasreen. And, and and the book, you know, somewhat ends on, on such a note. And when I was discussing this with a friend, she said, oh, my God, that wasn't feminist to me at all. That was just cruel. And that really made me think about, you know, all these tropes, all these genres. But but what are your views, Tara? What have you thought about, you know, stories where women have a right to their own bodies and, and where some just don't? Again, I, I think it's absolutely normal, you know, like I wouldn't call it again, I wouldn't call it a feminist feminist romance because to me, it's sort of like, firstly, what is a feminist romance, right? Like, <laughs> Yeah. Is a feminist romance sort of just portraying women who normal women, women who have jobs, women who have agency over their bodies? If that is a feminist romance, then yeah, sure. Mm. You know, uh, to me, you know, like it's these are things that are like just they are things that are very normal. There's yeah, nothing normal. great about yeah. a woman like having a, a job. Of life. Yeah, There's correct. nothing great about a woman having agency. There's nothing great about any of these things. But, we all but they're not being written. Exactly. So, yeah, the only so point hard. is that they're not being written. Yeah, so the yeah. fact that, oh, wow, we're all like, oh, this is amazing. It's being <laughs> written about as if it's revolutionary. Yeah. Wow, that's so sad, right? There should be Very like sad. thousands yeah. of these are yeah, exactly what you said. These are slice of life stories. There should be like a million thousands of them. But now they're coming up and uh, Riva Razan's book is you know, a feminist romance because what I think she does, what the books that you've spoken about, they're very dark, right? What she does is she includes these serious topics, includes the idea of a woman having an agency, having a job, all of these things. So does Anmol Malik, so does all the other authors I said. And puts it into something that's light, that's funny, that's accessible, that will make you laugh, that will make you smile. Puts it into the romance formula where there are meet cutes, where there is, you know, fun and games to be had where 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 you have the stomach fluttering and i think that if you think about that that is a feminist romance where you're taking things that are normal and you're not only focusing on one aspect of the woman's life but as i said that you're you're making the uh, you're making the romance fit into these other aspects of the woman's life versus having her fit the love story into someone else's life but you know, romance is very different from literary fiction. It's very different from non-fiction. It's very different from murder mystery because the whole idea of a romance, and I think that's what she meant when she said it's a romance, is that it is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be funny, you know. Yeah, and, and one more thing I was, you know, just thinking about Tara, like you mentioned, you know, it's so normal, yet romance has been getting a lot of trash, right? So that's that's another sad thing, but I think it is changing over time, and especially with our conversations with all these brilliant writers, I think we are understanding that slowly, you know, people are understanding that love stories are, you know, basic, right? Everyone thinks about love, so, you know, who wouldn't love to read stories? So I think we've had a lot of food for thought so far. So many tropes we have discussed, what the term could mean. You know, so we would love for you to tell us what you think about the term. Uh, you know, please do write to us. But right now, let's not delay this further. Let's just get into our conversation with Riva and hear it from herself. Hi, Riva. Welcome to Books and Beyond. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Hi, Riva. Welcome. 
Okay, so we're we're really really excited to be speaking with you today. Um, I actually read your book uh, when I was working with Kanishka, and I immediately really really loved it. Um, <laughs> so Michelle and I were just talking about how you know there's a gap in this kind of market. Um, so anyway, this episode is gonna have three sections. We know that you call your book a feminist romance, so we're gonna be dissecting this feminist. romance genre and we're going to be learning about your life as a creative person and then we're going to have reading recommendations and we have our signature rapid fire round so oh wow that's a rapid fire round yeah <laughs> <That's amazing. laughs> so uh you know um i found it very interesting after reading your book that um you know uh, i've never heard of this term actually you know feminist romance So can you explain what that term means to you and and how it's different from other other romance sub sub genres? Feel like in India people seem to write romance or the romantic genre off as something that's for people who are dense or, or silly or girls or they just uh, seem to devalue the entire concept of romance as something that's not as legitimate. um and what i was trying to do i had to call it a feminist romance because it was um it was taking a very strong female protagonist who had uh an ambition of her own and a mind of her own and charting her journey to coming of age but it was also at its heart a romance both in terms of the plot line and in terms of the aesthetic of the writing it's very lyrical if you read the book you see that there's a romantic aesthetic to it like the romantic movie and so i called it that just to sort of situate it as something that's a little more intelligent because it's imbued with political context it's a novel of female agency it's a girl who knows her own mind and it's a girl who's eventually moved to economic agency and all my writing seems to pivot on that okay so the next question is sponsored by penguin random house india they just released an lgbtq novel tell me how to be by neel patel and it's filled with 90s r&b music which made me super nostalgic just like your book riva i mean it's set in the 90s right and we see this changing landscape of the indian economy with the liberalization and i was curious about why you picked this period you know and what's your favorite memory from the 90s oh well i was actually born in 97 so i have no memory of the 90s um i just i found that period very interesting i did a major in both film and political science and i think one of our most pivotal political moments was when economic liberalization came to india like i found that period very interesting particularly because it created so many opportunities for working women when the mncs came to india and as someone who was writing this novel in her last semester of college i was looking at the world as a place that i was going to start working in and start charting my ambition in and then i was also looking backwards at what was the period for india where women really started becoming independent and i realized that for us it didn't happen all that far back it happened as recently as the 80s and 90s really a lot of women started becoming uh, like they started going into advertising in the 90s and that was because so many mncs came to india and needed advertising professionals or news media professionals before that we just had doordarshan So I found that entire concept of the rise of the working woman in the 90s after liberalization very very interesting and I knew that I wanted to write about that era. And so could you tell us a little bit more about this heroine uh, you know for those listeners who haven't read the book could you tell us a little bit more about the heroine of the story that you constructed and the premise of this book? Absolutely. So Arzu is the story of a young girl who is she's a very privileged young girl. She's been born in the upper socio-economic class of India, but um she's also been born uh in a sense to think of herself as purely ornamental. Her father goads her to and he bolsters her because he knows she has an intelligent thinking mind. He bolsters her to study economics, but in college she meets a boy and she falls in love with him and all she wants is to be his wife. and this is all happening in 91 and they've dated for 5 years and she really and he's from a big family just like her and all she wants is to make him happy and be his partner until his family decides that politically her father who is very outspoken in the community he's a editor of a very reputed newspaper her father is very libertarian and they're very protectionist in their economics 
her fam his family decides that she's not good enough she's too she's too much she's too bold she's too outspoken and her family's all wrong and they break off the engagement without telling her and suddenly her life goes to pieces and she doesn't know what to do next because up till now she's only bred herself to be his wife so her entire future in her head crumbles and her and everybody in society she thinks is laughing at her so her aunt takes her away to finishing school in new york um to be like polished and all of that stuff so that she can be wife to somebody else but in new york she discovers like this life of the mind she discovers that there her own capabilities she starts skipping finishing school to go to to go to journalism school at columbia and in discovering her abilities she discovers that there is so much more that she can do and she discovers her own ambition she makes friends with different people she goes to she goes on adventures she even falls in love again and then she has like a question to answer she has to pick between love and work and uh, we follow her on this journey to see what she'll do eventually that is a great description and it's also very intriguing to me you know because you said that you're born in 97 um yeah. and so you're growing up and your whole context is obviously very different from the context that arzu is growing up in and that arzu sort of uh, you know becomes an empowered woman much differently than than we would think about how you know we go about our lives today um and you did it so keenly you know i really like the book because there's not many romantic stories that also cover like the socio economic scene in such detail so what yeah. kind of research did you do for the book especially to get the details right uh, about the time period and also uh, you've covered the media industry uh, very thoroughly uh, so so what kind of research did you do to get into that frame of history or that context um, so like i said i was studying political science at college um so this was kind of the 90s were my favorite period to study in general so we studied this period extensively and i read a lot of the writings of like i read a lot of different takes by journalists and economists of this period um like jagdish bhagwati who is like a very far right not far right but like a very right wing economist and he contextualized my understanding his writings contextualized my understanding of the period to a great deal and then i also read some of amartya sen's writings of the period which were against a little bit like not for liberalization and then some nehruvian socialism that um, underscored and negated the liberalization so i tried to get a lot of different perspectives um on this period and then of course our chief economist montak singh alwalia's interviews about the period and how he um stood up for it and really fought for it or like manmohan singh's speech uh but he was introducing in uh, india as a new economy to the globe and then i also read um about the impact on the people there was a great like netflix documentary i think about life in the 90s where they talked uh, about india in the 90s and how things started changing they have like an 80s version and a 90s version and about how like doordarshan started changing into more channels started coming in and advertising money started coming in and how different everything was no i and it's it's great to hear all those sources and it's very curious you know because uh, there's this whole thing that uh, that's 90s nostalgia you know so i was yeah. from 1990 yeah. i think it was yeah it was a lot of fun like i remember i looking at all of these really cute ads that were done about paleji biscuits although this was like later 90s not 91 uh, but it gave me a lot of richness and color like in terms of just like I remember seeing an ad like a magazine ad for the first computers and they were like these big things uh and you had to pay money to like send one email um this was more set in the states though because I was trying to contextualize how Arzu would send her first email from university um and how her banter with Siddhant would start up uh it would actually be like this huge huge computer that would that was only available at certain universities so she had to do it from columbia from like she had to get like uh, permission from one of her professors to use it um, it's just so fascinating to think how um, you know fast technology has has progressed and as a 90s kid i remember you know the first computer that that we had it was one of those it was in 9 it was in 97 i think i uh, 96 or 97 where we had this Michelle, do you remember the dial-up computers? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and we couldn't we couldn't answer the phone when we had to connect. It was hilarious. Correct. 
So I used to spend sort of like all evening on that on those dial up computers playing like video games and like MSN <laughs> chat and so the fashion I loved like reading about that or like even looking at pictures of it because it was so interesting blue jeans had just come into uh, had just become like trendy both in India and in the states I think Cindy Crawford popularized that look. I don't know who popularized that look uh but like blue jeans and corduroy and all of this stuff and i had to interview a bunch of people um to figure out what everybody was wearing and what was trending and it was it was good fun no and, yeah, and you really did that yeah, yeah. sorry uh, you, d- you really did that well because what i liked you know what i look out for in books which are situated in a certain historical context is those small details you know it's not about shoving history in, in your like down your throat like it's a textbook but like it's woven very seamlessly together where the atm- where a reader doesn't even know how that atmosphere is created and that comes from doing research like you said you know talking to people figure out figuring out their fashion all of those stuff so very interesting to hear your perspective thank you so much uh, but i also want to talk about um, you you know you mentioned that there was a gap in popular indian fiction recently i have noticed that uh certain books have been have been filling in that gap you know yours for example is one of them these high brow feminist love stories that are well written that actually appeal to exactly me uh you know there's uh, anmol malik's book and there's um rehana mohir munir's paper moon so it's very interesting that you identified that there is this gap because there's so much content out there and you have identified a gap that's actually a very big gap uh so what advice would you give to writers who want to find a similar gap in the content market and go into that um i've just i've loved i've been raised on fiction like this i've been i think it's that um my mom always gave me a lot of books with strong women in them to help me understand my own journey through life and then i grew up in a family of storytellers of, of filmmakers and directors and so i've always been involved in the aesthetic of storytelling and i knew that i wanted to do something with narrative fiction in my life um and it just so happened that these became the stories that i most wanted to tell i'm i'd say writing for gaps kind of it doesn't work uh because i i don't think it ever maybe it does for other people i don't know but i i think that when you start trying to write to an audience it almost always sounds insincere um so i i would say that the best advice i got at college was to write this like it, it was to bring forth the buried treasure hidden within you um and there is like stories in everybody i think the stuff that is truly treasure within you and figure out how to bring that out and give it like a narrative form and honestly the audience doesn't know what they want it, it's like i could nobody knew they wanted chocolate before it was invented so you could make the next chocolate you just have to make sure that it's to your taste and you really like it write something that you delight in and other people will too no absolutely the story always comes before anything else your book has a very clear uh, audience uh, what kind of responses have you gotten from this audience some women have written to me um with very heartwarming responses they've written saying that they feel seen some have uh, told me that it helped them like while they were waiting in a hospital room it made them laugh um some have told me that they read it regularly so that that has been really really sweet i'm glad that i i, I mean i i read fiction because it lightens my day it makes me feel better and it helps me live and if i can do that for someone else that's that's basically why i'm doing this in the first place so we have another question sponsored by penguin random house india they recently published a translation of karnali blues which is the most widely read nepali novel in the last 20 years it shows this beautiful father and son relationship and i'm always drawn to books about parent child relationships um i think one of my most favorite things from your book riva is the relationship between arzu and her father ajit uh because he always stands up for her um so we usually see mother daughter relationships covered in indian fiction but this is rare so can you tell us the inspiration behind um indian girls who grew up in a very patriarchal context 
we kind of imbibe the patriarchy in the sense that we sometimes even if you're very privileged you don't believe that you have the agency to do certain things you don't give yourself the permission to do it especially um if you're kind of like a girly girl you're very feminine uh you think you're meant for one thing and sometimes it takes the man of the household the earning member of the household who does have economic agency to tell you that you can do more because and yeah, it really i took it a little bit from a trope that i read about janak and sita um where she was called janki right because she was so close to her father where he would actually make sure that she came and even though she was being bred to be married to a prince like ram he made sure that she came to the court with him so she also understood court negotiations and all of that so she was actually very very skilled because she understood both worlds the world of femininity and domesticity and also because of janak she understood the world of uh kinghood and um you know nobles and courtiership and all of that stuff and i found that very very interesting from the get go and my eldest mamu is the one who ajit is based on and he's always bolstered me my whole life um and he gave me like this book called how to be a genius when i was 10 years old and made sure that i read it cover to cover and taught me how to play chess and i became a district level chess playing uh, that was that girl in school um he made sure that i was always focused and all of that stuff that's how i won like my scholarship to nyu um and just generally always bolstered me like he taught me how to love fiction he taught me he has this massive library of agatha christie and every book under the sun really and he made sure that i read everything and then he would discuss them with me we still read together um all the time when he has the time um and really he's the reason i was capable of thinking of myself as a writer and creator and that's who ajit is based on and i think that it's important for girls to have someone like that in their life like oh wow i would have never guessed it so yeah riva you studied under uh, tishani doshi who's a really renowned fiction author uh, in nyu and um, michelle had actually interviewed her for her poetry collection girls are coming out of the woods which is sort of like an anthem for women so we really like her work and she's your mentor so can you please share a conversation uh, an anecdote uh, of a conversation that that you've had with her about arzu and how did she shape that for you absolutely tishani was actually uh, it was a little bit serendipitous honestly because i'm not even a creative writing major i'm film and political science so technically i shouldn't even have been allowed in her class but i heard that she was teaching this class and it was my last semester of college and i had read some of her writing and i was absolutely enthralled and i thought that you know if not now then when so i sent her an email randomly telling her that i would really like the permission to write for her and be in her class and hers was like an advanced fiction writing class you had to have all of these requirements to take it and she wrote back to me very generously and she was like you're so passionate please come and i jo- and honestly that first class with her i was blown away because she made us do this e- exercise called uh, reading the sentence where she made us literally all we did in that class was write one sentence each but it it sort of changed the way i looked at writing because we like read gustav flaubert and all of that stuff and i started looking at how to craft powerful sentences and how they build into prose like story and all comes later and it's good plot is important of course but she taught me how to distill the story and make sure that every sentence motivates it it's all like adding up and it every word is there and i think that's really because as a poet she really pays attention to words and her poetry is so beautiful it was a poet's lens on how fiction is created something that i'd never had because i've been so focused on like the drama of storytelling and the movement and the pace because that's what you do in film um but she took it and she made it like the the sentences of storytelling yeah a good mentor is a good mentor is really really critical um, you know uh, especially uh, as a writer you definitely need that sort of sounding board and sounding board of that quality but i'm also very interested uh, you know um, you've learned storytelling in places like paris florence new york um can you tell us a storytelling moment from one of these places and i'd say like living abroad in different places um allows you to see how different cultures view the world 
like for example the french are a little more like laid back and laissez faire and you know things happen and stuff is transitory and their storytelling really reflects that whereas americans are very like uh, optimize everything um so all their like their their stories moved to almost like a formulaic standpoint now like the the studio system is very you know this happens and then this happens and this trope and then that trope which is also what we do in india now to some extent uh but i like that like new cinema and new writing and i love that prose allows you to play a little like everything doesn't happen to have ha- have to happen like according to a formula it doesn't have to be like um she'll come of age this way it doesn't have to be like commercial fiction and sometimes those become the most commercially viable things the stuff that is surprises you i think what it basically taught me is that each culture has its own way of te- of reckoning with life and representing it in stories and to try and do that for the most uh, honest way for my experience of india or the current moment that i think we're living in so you know it's very interesting because we uh, read that you're a film student you've been a film student and you also write for a production house were you ever tempted to create a character who's in sort of the film world um uh well i kind of am right now I'm adapting sense and sensibility to an indian context so it's called nonsense and respectability and it comes out in the telegraph every week it's like serialized fiction at the moment and um that's kind of set um in in bombay and bollywood so that is a little bit like loosely based on my experience of the film industry do you you know do you encounter creative burnout because we we work in the creative space ourselves and we know how exhausting it can be you know it's fulfilling it's rewarding but after a hard day at work it's very difficult to sort of then you know write something for yourself so how do you manage that i actually don't get burnt out in the film industry so much because when you're writing um, for a writers room in screenwriting i think has evolved a little bit to have more than one voice in the room so you're always like in a writers room you're not doing it completely by yourself it's not quite that lonely anymore um so that's kind of nice you're always bouncing ideas off other people and seeing how things work and that really helps you it helps me at least it get, helps get the juices flowing it's not like 9 a.m you're sitting alone forever it's more like 9 a.m you're sitting alone for a little bit and then you're figuring it out with somebody else you feel like you're building like you and this other person or these two other people are co-creating this universe uh which is really fun so you're sharing like the lows together and the highs together so riva uh, you know coming back to the to the heart of the book which is um it's a love story at its heart right so we wanted to know what was the inspiration behind creating um you know the dynamic between uh, arzu and her love interest um you know is it for example because we do know that you're uh, surrounded by film people and you've always you know uh, been watching films so is it uh, bollywood that has you know influenced your uh, view of love or what is the inspiration it was just like the different tropes of men that uh, girls seem to encounter this so aditya is the um the legacy child trope that she would meet generally because that's the kind of society that she moves in like by by general collision she meets that she meets the uh, her prince charming right like he is the person that she's supposed to end up with by all uh, and that's the logical conclusion of her birth but he's also the person who would want her to be his trophy wife and whose parents might not think that she's good enough and then she has like siddhant who is the trope of the boy who um isn't uh, born in the same socio economic context as her but is a man of the meritocracy and so will help her in her growth he'll believe her believe in her because he's believed he's believed in himself he's the sort of person who can be a partner to her because he knows how to partner someone be partners with someone not just think of her as a doll and then rohit is the character who he's like this he's like another version a less confident version of aditya um and i feel like most girls encounter these three archetypes of men like the the democratic sort who's working very hard the entitled brat who doesn't really believe in himself and then the um the sort of prince charming who just has never had to work for anything and doesn't know how to expand his context to include somebody else and i think it's important for girls to see all three of these in fictional um uh, in a fictional context to then 
make their own decisions to figure out what they want from their life. It helps them with thought projections, with imagination. Yeah, absolutely. It reminds me of, um, you know, this episode that we are going to, re- uh, that we released with Astha Atre, who's a love guru. Um, and she's also, wow. yeah, she's, she's, she's a romance writer and she's written, she has a podcast on love and she's very, it's very interesting because she's a, a bit, uh, a little bit older than, uh, you know, Gen Z, but, um, she uses her own experiences, her own life story and sort of like talks about romance. And I think that's why a lot of, um, like women like us like to read these kind of books because yeah, it is a projection of uh you know the kinds of relationships they've had the kind of experiences they've had the kind of red flags you know uh it, it's always interesting to read it, read the red flags that you had in a relationship and that you didn't notice put in a book format because it sort of validates your whole point of view um so but i want to know did you learn anything new about this genre uh, of you know romance while writing this book that you didn't know before I think the the formula is pretty bang on like uh, because I love reading romances with strong women uh, at the helm of them I think there are the like the guiding posts that you have that you can read about in any craft of writing book they're very very bang on and they're very satisfying you just need to invent uh, characters that are interesting and um, maybe a time period that's interesting and then go and then write very honestly and then eventually it'll take you um it might take you someplace else and you have to experiment with that but in general i think um the romance genre is pretty well defined like it you feel it works even if um even if you once you start experimenting with it too much i've found that it never it, it doesn't feel as satisfying to read uh because i did my first draft of arzu was trying to be a little bit more experimental um so the ending was different the second half of the book was very different from the current manuscript so what was the second half i don't even remember it now but it it was like a whole different uh, version of events there was no ball uh, after meeting she met rohit very cursorily then he never made an appearance in the book again um it was it was just a very very bad first draft honestly uh but when i brought him back and i made it a proper like love triangle sort of thing where one like a part of the love triangle was also a complication with sarah and then a complication with her own ambition it got interesting and climactic and dramatic and that's really what you turn to fiction for you turn to be like titillated and moved and uh, you turn to feel something and i think the romance genre knows how to make you feel something absolutely and speaking of you know bad first draft shitty first drafts um you're a debut writer uh, this is your first book and it's done amazingly well and now you know you're re- being represented by another agency for your next book um so what was your journey like towards finding a publisher you know so many writers often struggle to get past that first stage um so what was your journey uh, honestly my journey was pretty seamless um i got lucky in kanishka because i wrote an email so i finished the manuscript uh i got the draft to like a point where i liked it uh and i had just come back from college and i was working with uh, ria again i've been working with her since i was 14 years old um and i had a free morning and i thought i'd take a chance on this and i had researched all of these literary agents to send it to uh, well at first i was trying to pitch it in the states so i had sent it to all of these literary agents uh in new york and they were all like no we're not interested in a south asian protagonist really like they didn't see it uh that way but that was the underlying message but i was like oh no this is too bad so i started looking for literary agents in india and i got it off of off a of google search and kanishka is the best represented online like he actually has like a page and all of that stuff so i sent it to him i wrote a, the same query letter that i had written to the uh, publishing the literary agents in new york i sent him the pitch and then he re- responded almost immediately saying this sounds promising um send me the first draft or whatever and i sent it to him and in 3 or 4 days he responded saying he's very interested and that he really likes it and then he called me and we went from there 
amazing that just goes to show that yeah if your content is good then you know your story will find a place your story yeah. will get out there yeah so that, uh, literature is like publishing and liter- literature is the most meritocratic thing in the arts here personally i think so like they know because i didn't know anybody in liter- in literature like i know i work in film i had no i have never never even been to like the whole literary sector in delhi um and i'm like not plugged into this environment at all so it was very they if, if they they're, they're true like lovers of writing if they like it they'll take a chance on you right and so have things changed for you since like because you know you said that you're not you were not part of this literary scene and now you know you have your first book out so how is how have things changed for you nothing's changed for me <laughs> i just talk to more people who like books now um i mean i guess stuff has changed for me in that um people like the book and i've joined like a conversation of literature which is nice um and i get to go and see my book at bookstores which is lovely that's a lot of fun a big like pinch me moment was when i saw my book at crossword at the airport <laughs> um but other than that i'm just glad that people are reading it um i was always going to write honestly like i was always going to write books if people and people would eventually publish it or i'd like amazon self publish it or i'd honestly whatpad is such a great medium now kiss the kissing booth got picked up off of that and um, a bunch of other books got picked up off, off, off of that and turned got turned into netflix movies so i just think that if you feel like you have stories to tell write it and distribute it through whatever platform will take you and if it's good enough then it'll get um it'll get seen i think so at least no absolutely and you know speaking of film when i read the book at least i thought that it would make a it would make a perfect movie you know yeah so i wanted to ask you is it being adapted yes it is but i can't uh, talk congratulations about it. it's oh, amazing lovely. fantastic <laughs> new when is it going to come out I can't say anything. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay, but that's amazing. It's been picked up by a production house in LA, so it's going to be like hopefully a, a multicultural thing. Um, but yeah, it's exciting. My fingers are crossed. So you can't like predict these things. Um, sometimes uh, things get made and don't get released. I've been in film for a long enough time to know that. But right now, it's been optioned, so that's. Uh, that's good news i guess i hope it gets made wow congratulations i can't wait to watch the movie version i i really did enjoy uh, the book yeah, and i've recommended yeah. it to lots of lots of people as well it's been optioned as a series not as a movie so as a series oh, wow. series as well that's even better because then it has a much longer shelf life yeah exactly i was just yeah. going to say that yeah, yeah yeah the characters do lend themselves to i mean i was just like i could tell that you were from a film, film background when i was reading it because it was so sort of cinematic in its feel as well that yeah yeah and i was telling tara i think one of the most interesting things were the interactions between people right like the dialogues as if like you know when you watch it on screen you rarely see such interactions in books okay anyway this brings us to one of our most fun sections of the interview which is our reading recommendations uh, section so um uh sorry i was going to call you arzu <laughs> okay <laughs> Okay. I um, love that. I, yeah, I just you know there were times where I was like okay who's Reema who's Arzu. <laughs> okay. Oh, all, right. <laughs> all right. Okay. Um so Reema which were the books that you read while writing Arzu? So you know we've heard where some writers don't read other books because they think oh it may influence influence their voice but some do read it because you know it provides them inspiration. So we wanted to know what was your process like and which books did you read? Oh I read a lot of books while reading Arzu. Half the reason I'm writing is because it gives me I can read fiction and call it research. It's the best job ever. Um I read like so in terms of craft of writing I read like Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. I read that before I start any um writing project because it just fills you with all of this enthusiasm and passion for writing. Um I read um What was I reading? Right, I read the Romantic Manifesto by Ayn Rand. It's like the flip side of reading a uh, big magic. It fills you with like all of this political determination for creating stories. Um I read uh, Gone with the Wind. I read Scarlett O'Hara's character bits of it a lot because she just has so much spunk. I know that it's been like denounced now uh 
for racial reasons but uh, i think her character was just so spunky and courageous and audacious i love reading her um what else did i read um i think i read bits of emma uh because she she operates with this like um with this immense world of possibility within her just because she comes like from this period this uh world of privilege so you have like this mindset of you know all doors will open for me um austin is very good for that in general she's good for language and sentence construction um what else did i read i'm sorry i wrote this in like 2019 um no 2018 so i don't remember at the other things that i was reading at that time um no but this is a good indication and uh, yeah uh, gone within wind is still one of my favorite books you know it's uh, beautifully beautifully wrought that story yeah. i was also, i think i was reading like a bit of um, have you read george at hail no but my mom my it's one of my mom's favorite series yo oh, she's a, she's not a series but she's like a author of different romance i know i know books. like the she's the author she's one of my mom's yeah. favorite authors yeah she's very sweet and she always has like a um, for the victorian for the regency period she has like very um very strong minded women <laughs> who fall in love so that was really fun um my uh, a very like dear old friend had uh, recommended her to me she was also like she's like of my grandmother's age almost but she like she changed the way i thought about romance writing a little bit yeah she's a great uh, you know a, a great author so okay so three feminist romances that you would recommend uh, they can be indian or foreign oh i love palace of illusions but i'm guessing that everybody's recommended that on the show not really um, no palace of illusions know. is beautiful because it's um i mean that was the real first feminist book i ever read because to take the mahabharat and tell it from draupadi's perspective is so audacious and she's done it in such a like complex beautiful romantic way i absolutely adore that book i hope i will fan girl about chitra banerjee divakar need to lie die i've met her once and i'm such a i'm such a groupie for like authors that i love it's so funny um i hope that she hears this podcast and like dms me or something um what else uh, would i recommend i recommend anything by meg cabot because she's so much fun there's this book called every boy's got one that i absolutely love it's about um it's this romance that it's about eloping to italy um it's really funny and she's like a cartoonist the the heroine is a cartoonist who's making a lot of money suddenly and it's a very sweet novel told in emails i think that everybody should read it um what else would i recommend now since i've recommended two fun things i'm going to recommend one series thing um a feminist real oh i recently read this book called city of friends uh by a lady named joanna trollope and it's really fun because it is it isn't it isn't a romance at all it, it it's about four working women in their 40s grappling with life and work and their husbands and it's a lovely read also the best of everything by um ooh, how am i forgetting who the best of everything is by i love rona ja uh it is the precursor to everything it's the precursor to every friendship novel ever it was written in 1959 Uh, or before that too, nineteen forty something. I think nineteen forty something. It's the precursor to Mad Men. It's the precursor to Sex and the City. It's the precursor to the group. It's the uh, first like women are friends in New York and working book ever. Um, that has been on my. That's been on my list forever. Uh, you but I haven't. It. Yeah. So now I'm definitely going to read it after after you recommended it. And Meg Cabot is like literally one of my yeah. <laughs> one of my favorite authors. I love her. I, I thought I was the I was uh, Mia, you know, because I had very frizzy hair with like glasses. <laughs> oh, that's and, so sweet. Yeah, and then I had this makeover where I like got my hair straightened and got contacts, and I I literally I thought that. I was Mia. <laughs> that's so sweet. Honestly, when I'm uh, I still like dip into Princess Diaries all the time. I love it. 
I recently yeah. read this. Oh, sorry, yeah. Michelle. Yeah, and I was going to say that it took me back to my school days because we, you know, young girls, all of us used to read Meg Cabot at that point. Like, we were obsessed with her books. Yeah. yeah Which yeah, one was your favorite? There, there was another one of mine that basically, like, that she, this, this girl falls in love with a ghost. With a but ghost. he's a very oh, hot ghost. Yeah, <laughs> I was just going to say that. Yeah, yeah that oh was God, underrated. I love the mediator series. <laughs> <laughs> I loved that, you know. I was like, oh, nobody can see him, but she can. It was really fascinating. Oh, he he set up, the, and like, that's what made me realize that, wow, you just need to find, like, a boy who has a very old soul. <laughs> he was basically that archetype, like, a very old-fashioned, conventional. He was literally born in a different era and died. <laughs> yeah, literally. I mean, that is also a trope, if you think about it. Uh, it's a fantastic know, trope. Somebody ought to bring it back. Yeah, I recently read, I'm just reading this book right now, um, which reminds me a lot of the conversation, you know, your earlier point, which you had said that you'd want sort of like books to project different kind of relationships. So I'm reading this book, uh, Dolly Alderton's Ghosts. Uh, It's really, really funny. So it's about basically this woman who's 32. She's a food writer. She and she's written a couple of books and she lives in London. And uh, basically, she broke up with her boyfriend of seven years a uh, couple of like two three years ago and she's entering this whole new world of dating and you know all the different things that happened to her and all the different kinds of relationships it's a very sort of like funny witty book that I think I think you'll really enjoy given now that I've heard some of your recommendations yeah a hundred percent I'm going to text you about it so you can text me the names of all your recommendations yeah, definitely <laughs> Yeah, so, um, you know, talking about Meg Cabot and, and all these, uh, you know, authors and books that have really, I think, made our childhood or growing up years, you know, we were curious, Riva, which were the books that you grew up on, right? And you said, you know, you were born in 1997. So, um, while growing up, for example, in school or, you know, through your friend circle, especially books with strong female leads, so which were those books? Um, there were so many. Honestly, I feel like it, um, it's hard to... Definitely the Princess Diaries like figured in there. Uh, Meg Cabot like shaped a lot of my voice and my personality in general just because Mia taught you how to be okay with yourself because she was so not okay with herself <laughs> and she figured it out through writing and I figured it out through writing so it was great to graph my like entire life trajectory on that. Um, the Princess Diaries was definitely instrumental and formative in that sense and there was um, I used to read this writer called Jacqueline Wilson a lot. Uh, she used to write stories for young girls. I don't know if you've read like Cookie or My Sister Jodie, but they were just delightful, delightful books. Um, she was a British author. I, think she, I don't know why I'm using the past tense. She might still be alive. Uh, but she, And writing. But uh, I read all all of her books. Like There was a Tracy Beaker series and um, Cookie and My Sister Jodie and Darlings and like a bunch of books like that um who else did i grow up on sophie kinsella was big at that time i remember the confessions of of, of a shopaholic series it was uh silly but fun um and i admired the fact that she was uh trying to be a journalist stuff always seemed to work out for her though magically and i remember laughing at her foibles but it was still very very fun um I also of course grew up on Percy Jackson and Harry Potter like everybody else they were I think that was also because those were like mythological beautifully wrought stories like they were very big dramatic arcs and they took huge mythologies and condensed them down so you you learn so much about cultures through those books you also learn a lot about like classical storytelling from those books and uh general moral concepts C.S. Lewis's Narnia was the same way for me. I loved that entire series. Um, yeah, those are a bunch. Then I could go on and on. Honestly, this is all I did growing up. Um, same here, Riva. Like all your like, I was smiling throughout your recommendations because Narnia, yeah. Meg Cabot. I have to admit, yeah. I used to like. I used to read really like. I used to also read Sweet Valley and and Baby oh, Sister and all of those kind yeah, of books too. Those- you yeah. know, this Sweetary author, I was just Googling her recently. She wrote like something like 300 books. I want to be her. But she, but uh, like, then I, but then she didn't write them it, because they always had created by. Most written or whatever. Yeah, but most written. But it's, it's yeah. amazing but it the not, amount of books. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know that happened with yeah. Nancy Drew? Sorry. No, I, I, I read Nancy Drew and I don't know whether I should start now. I tried it once, but I don't, <laughs> it didn't take. 
Yeah, no, actually, you know, the thing was, one thing I didn't know back then was it was written by, um, I think, two writers. Like, you know, obviously, they used a pseudonym. But again, it was like a rude shock. Uh, when I grew up, like, oh, it was someone else. But I think Nancy Too was one of the, you know, those books which were easily available. Like, in my school yeah. library, it was that, then it was Goosebumps. So I became a huge fan of these books back then. Yeah. Then growing up, like, it changed a little bit when I became an adolescent. Then I started reading all the, like, sticky uh, pop culture things, like the Gossip Girl series or the Pretty Little Liar series. I read all of those in book form. There were, like, 10 books or 11 books each. Um... And there were a bunch of, a bunch of oh, series. Really? Oh, really? Yeah, then there was I, the Devil's Wears Prada. I saw the shows. Oh, yeah, yeah, Devil Wears Prada. <laughs> that <laughs> was really good. Like, she had yes. uh, Last Night in, at Shato Momo. There's also, like, there are these other American writers that are really good. But for some reason, they didn't make it big in India. I don't know why. Uh, they're very big abroad, though. And they're really, really good. Like, there's Rainbow Rowell, who I really heavily recommend to anybody who likes, like, who who likes being a girl and likes books and likes uh, reading this. She's written Landline, Attachments, uh, Fangirl, Eleanor and Park. They're all lovely romances. You must read them. If you like Nora Ephron, you love her writing. I style. love Nora Ephron and, and Eleanor and Park is on my list again. So now that you've said all these books, I will definitely... Eleanor and Park is the, like the least of her works. Like really? Read, Attachments is beautiful. It's abs- If you're sick and you read it, you'll feel joy again. Wow, okay. Yeah. Good. You know, because you always have like such a big uh, book, uh, uh, TBR to be read list. And there's like different books that keep moving up and down the list at different times. So I'll definitely make sure to prioritize. I'm telling you are the ones that don't, like they never made it to my TBR list. It was more like I picked it up and I finished it in like a day because it was Those so- are the best kind of books yeah. that you just finish in a day. Okay, so should we move on to the rapid fire round? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. So worried. <laughs> Make me sound good, guys. There's nothing controversial. <laughs> so, one film that taught you more about storytelling than a book? Uh, this is so hard. Wait, actually, right now it's DDLJ. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Writing or vacationing in Paris? Uh... Reading in Paris. Wow. Oh, I love that. <laughs> with a ca- with a cross on. So, but uh, I also forgot to ask you before this whole rapid fire round. Uh, this thing I wanted to ask you: What do you think about? Um, you know, there's this new trope that uh, that that everybody is watching nowadays. You know, it's Emily in Paris, the bold type, younger. I'm sure you've heard of all these shows, which are sort of like women at work, chicklets. You know. So what do you think of this sort of like girl boss genre? Is that also like a feminist romance? Yeah, absolutely. I love it. I'm all for it. We need, I'd rather it be there than not. You know what I mean? Even if you're doing it in a, a like whatever, you can call it frivolous or whatever. I'm just glad that it's there. They're represented well. They're looking good. They're, um, it might be a little bit like bubblegum economic agency, but I'm all for that. Like as long as, you can say what you like about the genre, but people are lapping it up. And I love seeing confident young girls on television or in movies um, doing that, earning money and looking good while doing it. Like, I think that's fantastic. Um, that's the best of all worlds. Okay, okay, so now for the rapid fire question, I'm just adding this question. Which of these Girl War series do you like the best? Emily in Paris, The Bold Type or Young Girl? I haven't watched Younger. Um, I love the different type. I think I like you have to watch Younger. It's my absolute favorite, especially now since you're an author, because it's all about the publishing industry. It's all about these like you know women oh, working yes. in the publishing industry in New York. So, <laughs> oh, that's so much fun! I will definitely watch it. In yeah, that case. that that reminds me of the Proposal, one of my favorite movies, because it's all about publishing. Oh yeah, yeah that's so much fun. Anything that has love, right. pub- oh, any- sorry, okay. no, I'm saying anything that has love publishing in New York, I will watch it. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> uh, let's uh, move on to the okay, next question. Next. Yeah. All right. Abu Dhabi or Mumbai? Oh, Bombay, definitely. My family is here. One thing about Bombay that you wouldn't trade for anything in the world. Uh, one thing about Bombay that I wouldn't trade for anything in the world. 
my cup of coffee in the morning honestly i look at the trees and i drink a cup of coffee and that falls right with the world at that point oh that's the best okay one characteristic of arzu that you share i'm uh as much of a romantic as her oh that's so nice okay so where <laughs> yeah. so where do you write um wherever they let me <laughs> um i write all over the place honestly i write from a library um at a club that i'm a member of um i write from starbucks a lot because i feel like that's how you get to see people um i also write from the production houses that i work at a lot like whichever production house i'm working at currently i write from there um they like creative room awesome and one unique r- ritual or anything that you do from your writing routine um i have to have one cup of coffee while i'm writing at least at the start of it and then something that i do that really helps me that i think would might help other writers too is that i read for 30 minutes minimum before or the voice of whatever i'm trying to do before i start writing so it doesn't feel like i'm doing it from scratch um everything's been written or said in a certain way already so just find something that's kind of like comparative to what you're trying to do and read it for 30 minutes or 40 minutes and it'll wow, help you that's get... really smart oh, yeah, that's like, a good tip that's quite interesting yeah yeah, but... yeah. you don't feel so alone you feel like you're a part of a bigger conversation you don't feel it's not as daunting but i always feel like you know like i try and do that sometimes when i like read uh, what you what exactly what you're doing but then how do you differentiate between doing that and then you know like becoming too similar to what you read because for me that's a very big issue and i find that i actually can't read something that's very similar to what i'm writing because i end up sort of like copying it if you know what i mean yeah i think i'm too vain to copy somebody else's voice uh i have like a lot of my own voice already and even while reading uh the other thing i don't necessarily agree with i find it very hard to like agree with a lot of other writers um either they like political underlying political theory or underlying like whatever the theme is i don't agree with a lot of it i sometimes resonate i mostly resonate with it that's why i'm reading it um but my voice does filter in just because i'm of a different moment and of a different context so i think that once you take what you've understood and then you try and fit it in into your honest voice it it can't be the same as somebody else's work that makes sense yeah yeah actually you know tara even i have felt that but uh, over time it, it kind of becomes a habit so what what i do is i detach myself from it like i then then when i basically come to the blank page i realize okay michelle this is you the characters are yours and it's completely different from that it's kind of like a you know you're rewiring or resetting um uh, your mindset mm, that's what helps me right yeah cool okay <laughs> <laughs> so what are you writing uh, what's next yeah. for you riva Um so the Nani Diaries is coming out in terms of literature the Nani Diaries is my second book it's been published by Harper Collins and it's coming out in either September or October this year um and I'm very excited about that so and I'm currently writing something I'm working on a third novel and I will let you know how that turns any, out any hints about what that third novel is about uh right now i mean it's kind of being serialized in telegraph right now it's an adaptation of sense and sensibility okay okay that's the one uh, we'll check that's it out that's the one yes so please check it out and if you have any feedback let me know what you think of it and you think of the characters and i'd love to know what you think cuz i'm currently writing it and i could use all the perspective that i can get awesome yeah and it's cool that you're yeah. like putting it out in a serialized format i don't know many authors who 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 do that before uh publishing it as a novel so that's very interesting yeah what, i think it's a very good mechanism digitized or like they're scared of it getting like ripped off right yeah sure i think that that insecurity or that that feeling is there but it's also quite interesting because like you said um i don't think um often writers get a chance to get feedback right so this is a very yeah. interesting way have you got no, feedback it, from the column like the from the no not too? just from the column like i uh, people have started reading it because i've been doing it for something like i'm on episode 29 now so it's been 29 weeks of me writing this so i've built up a readership through that 
and then I have some loyal readers of that who haven't even read Arzu or any of my other work. They just read that and they're really enjoying it. And then on a week where if they feel like it's going off, they write to me also saying this is going off. And then I have like live, it's like somebody live tweeting your chapters. Um, so I can then course correct right there. Although, of course, I don't take that as gospel either, but it's good to know. It's good to get like a lot of voices in. Yeah, that's sort of like like what Wattpad is also trying to do. But you're obviously doing it, you know, uh, through a newspaper medium, which is very interesting. I'll definitely check out um, check out what you've written so far. I'd love to hear what you think. I would love to give you feedback. I'm sure I love it. <laughs> yeah. When I read Arzu, I really loved it. I'm so glad. And it's and it's also cool, you know. I I like this stage when you know you're just you're like beta reading because you know when I uh, usually um uh, you know provide some kind of feedback to the writer, I always go and look at the final product in the book and I say, hey, did the writer work on it? I actually hunt, uh, you know, for that detail and and see whether the writer has worked on it. It's very interesting to be part of this, you know, pre uh publication stage. Yeah. So thank you so much, Riva. This is very interesting yes. and thank lot of book recommendations. So much. And yes. insight into Thank your you. writing process, and you know we are fans. So congratulations, and hope you keep writing many more books. Thank you so much. I'm a fan of your podcast and of your endeavor. This is incredible, and it's it's honestly so generous of you to interview other authors and keep the literary scene alive in India. I'm so glad people are doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And we can't wait to see Arzu's adaptation. So that was refreshing. There was a lot to think about, and we and we really hope that you like both the sections. Um, it is always sad when a conversation ends, but we are eagerly waiting for the next episode, which is just the two of us. Um, so Michelle and I are going to be discussing migration literature. We're going to be discussing what are migrant stories, what are the tropes, what changes we would like to see because it is a burning topic right now. uh especially you know in the world we live in with the pandemic with border issues um you know and and normal people just migrating to the US or Canada or coming as students yeah i can't wait for that conversation tara uh but yeah all you writers out there don't forget if you want to write your book sorry yeah uh if you want to book our mentorship slot for the year use the discount code boundmenti2022 to get a 10% discount on our 3 month mentorship program so the offer ends on march 1st so what are you waiting for the link is in our show yeah we've got some amazing writers signed up so far so sign up and be part of this amazing cohort thank you so much for tuning in to books and beyond with bound and we'll be back next wednesday with our own episode Bye bye